is for living. All right. This conversation right here is uh, one that I've been looking forward to because uh, I have an amazing book in front of me right here. If you can see this, I'd recommend that you go pick this up and go read it. I'm not as far as I would like to be into this book before having this conversation. However, the bits that I have got through are pretty awesome. Now, the lady that I'm going to interview today, and you probably see here on the cover, CIA to CEO. Now, I met her probably about a month or so ago in London through a mutual um, contact, uh, Rakesh, Rack, he would like to be called. And um, immediately, I was like, I've got so many questions about the CIA and all this clandestine stuff. We're not going to cover a lot of that in this episode. However, however, there is so much to be learned. And this conversation is very different to the one that we typically have about investing in mortgages. This conversation sits around the periphery of money. So being able to optimize yourself as an individual, be being purposeful, being laser focused, because believe me, if you can't learn something from someone who's been in the CIA to the degree that she has been in the CIA, then I don't know if you would ever learn anything from anyone. So my guest today is uh, Rupal Patel. She is uh, an, a CEO, an advisor, she's a consultant, and she's also an author of this amazing book from six, from the CIA to the C, to a CEO. And I'm just going to bring her in now because I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'm I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as well. Rupal, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for the, making the time. And may I just say as well, I know that Monday, according to your schedule, isn't <laughs> typically when you kind of do these types of things. I think you leave it till a Tuesday. So I, I'm thankful that you're doing this with me on a Monday. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's so great to be here. So for the benefit of those who are listening and watching, because this will be a video available on YouTube at 12 p.m., can you give a really brief introduction to you? Um, I know that's a really hard question because yes. there's so much to be told, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to digging into things. Fine. Uh, I'll give you some of the biggest bullet points. So born and raised in New York, I am the one of four kids born to an Indian American immigrant family. I am a self-professed nerd and lifelong learner. And as you alluded to in the introduction, my career has taken me from the CIA to now being a two-time CEO turned strategist, consultant, executive coach, and best-selling author. And um, I love having conversations like this. So I'm looking forward to getting started. Brilliant. So I think the, the question that will be on everyone's lips right now, and this mm -hmm. is probably the first thing I asked you when we met is, how did you get into the CIA? <laughs> so the very abridged version of that story is I was in graduate school. I was studying international affairs. And my plan was after graduation to join the Foreign Service and become a diplomat as part of the U.S. State Department. And um, while I was there, uh, somebody from the CIA asked me if I would be interested in applying to, uh, to the CIA. And so I wasn't really sure what I would be doing. I had no concept of what the work of a CIA officer was, aside from what I misunderstood from movies and, and TV shows. And so I just thought, you know what, why not give it a go and see what happens? So yeah, I went through the process. It was not part of the plan. Uh, but the more I got to speak to the people, a lot, you know, as part of the, the, the process and the, my interviews and all of that, it just seemed like it would be a really, really wonderful place for someone like me who is interested in learning about other cultures, living in other countries, you know, learning languages, and, and just testing myself in new ways, in ways that I probably didn't even know I could be tested in. So from what was initially a very sort of unexpected invitation, it turned out to be one of the best career decisions I could have ever made. Amazing. And how long were you with the CIA for, roughly, would you, About six you say, years. during the career there? Six years. Brilliant. Yep. Okay. So th there is, I guess, this um, maybe this notion, according to TV, you know, if you're watching, you know, the Born Identity and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. around what it is like to actually work at the CIA. What was it like for you? Did it meet your expectations? And mm -hmm. did you have any preconceived notions that you're thinking, actually, well, this is very different? So... I had some preconceived notions, again, like I said, largely from movie and TV. And so when I got there, I had to try to, uh, I guess, leave all of that at the door kind of thing, just because 
you know, it's not to surprise to anyone, but Hollywood is not often a very accurate reflection of reality. And mm-hmm. so I tried to go in with as open a mind as possible and to almost be as blank slate as blank a slate as possible. And I guess what surprised me was just the scope of the kinds of work that we do. So it wasn't just for the spy to go out and, you know, get assets and collect information, but there was a huge cadre of analysts. So that's what I joined. I joined the analyst um, at the time that was called the Directorate of Intelligence. So uh, where all the analysts are, Uh, but then there were scientists, there were designers, there were doctors, there were all sorts of professions represented within the, the walls of the agency. And it just, it, never stopped surprising me how much talent and what varied talent we had within those walls. So it was sort of like being a kid in a candy store, but in in the sense that once I got in, I realized that there were many different ways that I could have a career at a place like that and do very, very different things. So just because I started as an analyst didn't mean that that's what I would be doing you know, forevermore if I so chose. Um, and then the other thing was that there was a lot of uh, independence within, you know, sort of certain boundaries, but I was an analyst and did sort of analytical office based sort of, you know, uh, intellectual, like heavily intensive, uh, intellectual work for about 60% of my time. But the other 40% of the time was going overseas and working with our partners and other, uh, intelligence organizations and, 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 and sometimes, you know, helping the collection efforts and that kind of thing. So it was a really great place to effectively design the career that I wanted. And I had, as I said, a lot of independence within certain boundaries to, to do uh, the things that I thought would be most interesting. One of the things that you mentioned in the book is the fact that it helped you really um, accentuate and develop your strengths. Hmm. And those became things that ended up giving you almost like an edge in, in, in what you were doing. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of, you know, um, identifying your strengths and your weaknesses and how I think there's, there was this Tiger Woods analogy where they, you know, they were talking about his development and how, mm-hmm. you know, his, his coach and his trend is identified, well, you're not great at this. So let's focus on your strengths and move mm-hmm. that dial because you're naturally yep. good at it yep. and maybe incrementally increase those weaknesses. So you're yep. a little bit better, but yep. most of your gains come from your strengths. Can you talk a little bit about that and your experience around that and the importance of it? Absolutely. Yeah. I think for most of our lives, and again, to some extent, it makes sense, but we're told to work on our weaknesses, you know, and we're often given developmental areas at work or at school to, to, fix things that, you know, someone has deemed isn't up to a certain standard. And there is a a relevance and a place for that. But for, I firmly believe that by the time most of us are in our, I would say probably even sort of as early as our twenties, maybe a little bit later, we've effectively, we are in many ways who we are and our strengths are in many ways our strengths. And instead of investing all of the time and effort and agony, we often invest in trying to, to work on our, our perceived weaknesses, as you, you, know, you just suggested there, there's so much more mileage in absolutely investing in and amplifying and in double downing on, or doubling down on your strengths, because that's where you are remarkable and you are exceptional. I think, you know, we have this notion again, largely through school that we need to get everybody to almost be like a bland vanilla of a certain type, but Mm -hmm. there will be some people who are going to be incredible creators, others who are really, really good negotiators, others who are really great at storytelling, you know, whatever the, the, the situation may be. And one of the things that I realized during my time at the CIA was I always knew that I was a bit of a nerd. You know, I I loved, like I said, I loved school. I I, I am a self-professed nerd. Uh, I love analysis and I love information and understanding and, you know, all of that kind of getting to the fundamentals of things. But what I also very quickly realized, and this was a surprise to me, was that I really, really loved the communication side of things. So not just the written side, not just, you know, writing reports and briefs and that kind of thing, but actually engaging with human beings much in the way we're doing now. And so... That element of, you know, making connections, doing the analysis, all of that combined with having a really, really strong 
communication ability and sort of verbal communication became something that I just naturally, again, started looking for more opportunities to do. And it's something that I now, whenever I'm choosing, you know, to pivot or to do something new or to try something, there are some core fundamentals that I make sure that I are always present is, again, Will I be helping solve problems? Because at the end of the day, that's what, you know, all of the analysis and knowledge and learning I did was geared towards was to help people solve problems or to make sense of the world. So am I helping solve problems? Am I able to use my communication skills, both written and and verbal? And also, is there a lot of room for just making connections, not just between ideas, but between other people? Because for me, those are my superpowers. It's the the analysis, it's the communication, and it's the connections. And so whenever I'm deciding, oh, well, should I try this or should I try that? I always make sure that, well, will I be able to weave in at least two of those three elements? Because that's where I know I can add the most value. That's where I differentiate myself from other people who might do similar things to me. And that the same is true for all of us. And so it's, again, at this point, I imagine most of your listeners will be at least sort of in their mid twenties or around that age and, and and older. You know, instead of just constantly obsessing over, oh, I need to work on this, I need to work on that. Think very carefully about what your strengths are and find ways to amplify those and bring them into your day to day, whether it's in investing or in your career in some other capacity, because that's where the real gains can be made. And for any of you, I love sports. Uh, so the way I use I use it in the sports analogy here, which is applicable as much to your skills as it is to you know your lives. But I often refer to taking you know the, what I call the heptathlete approach, which is you know for those of you who don't know, the heptathlon is a women's sport where the women who compete compete in six different events. Now those who get to reach the gold medal and become world champions aren't the best at all six, they choose mm. one, two, probably around at maximum three events that they're going to invest all of their time, their training, their resources, their efforts into, those are their strengths. And then they just are good enough at the others to make sure they qualify. Because the reality is you cannot be amazing and world-class you know, at all six, so you have to choose very carefully. And the same is true as I said, of our personalities and our strengths. So, you know, what are the two, three core strengths that you're really going to work on and just allow yourself to be good enough at all the other stuff. But it's also true from a time management slash sort of trying to find some sanity in our very, very oversubscribed lives. Don't try to be all the things and do all the things to all the people. Mm. Use the two or three things that are most important to you and just be good enough at all of the others. So it's that... I guess fundamentally sort of that my time at the agency wasn't just about understanding myself better and my strengths, but it was also about taking that analytical approach to myself. You know, a lot of the things I just shared with you now, or a lot of the things that I share in the book came from self-analysis and turning that analytical prowess inwards to help me and, you know, those who read, read my book and the others that I work with to just leverage who they are in a much more powerful way. Yeah, and there were so many things you said there because there is an exercise in the book where you actually take people through this, like really understand you and how to apply yourself. And you 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 did mention there the things that you were your were your strengths. I am interested though, and I'm sure everyone will be thinking this as well, listening. You know, you're working for the CIA, mm-hmm. you're an analyst. So the information that you're trying to make sense of to essentially present, which then has outcomes and decisions are going to be made upon those that that piece of analysis that you've mm-hmm. done you have to be really confident mm. in right this is the right this is what the information is telling me mm-hmm. these are the possible outcomes this is what it means if there are variations you've got to be really confident in your own ability mm-hmm. did you ever have a moment of you know imposter syndrome like I don't, I'm not all uncertainty. Did that, did you ever have that? So no to the imposter syndrome, but yes to the uncertainty to the extent that nothing in the world is a hundred percent knowable. Nothing is a hundred percent predictable or gameable or, you know, you can create infinite scenarios and one little thing changes. And then of course the outcome changes. And so what being in that environment where, you know, your analysis is going to be at least read by, if not used by decision makers at the highest levels, there's a real, real huge emphasis 
on being very clear and very concrete about the shortcomings, about the gaps. And so, you know, whenever we would write a piece of analysis and it was always this collaborative effort where, yes, perhaps I would be the author, but then we would have an entire team where we would poke holes in it. We would say, oh, well, have you considered this angle or that angle to make it as robust as possible? But we always made sure that we would also say, hey, by the way, Mr. President, this is our best analysis, and this is sort of the methodology, and these are the sources and our confidence in the sources. But by the way, here are the many things or the five things that we don't know, and any one of those things could change the picture. So it wasn't pretending like the ambiguity or the uncertainty wasn't there. It was being very, doing the best that you could to try to, um, you know, sort of think through the possibilities and 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 fix any potential holes in your logic, but then being very, very upfront about, hey, but by the way, here's what we don't know. And here's how you know it could affect things. Or here's where we're a little bit less certain about our, our analysis because of X, Y, or Z reason. And I think, you know, in our culture, both, you know, sort of well, many cultures, there's this obsession with certainty and an obsession with getting the answer and being right and being the expert. But the reality is the world and everything is so much more nuanced than that. And so instead of, you know, going up in front of a, a room full of decision makers and being like, yep, I bought this and, you know, being afraid of anyone asking you questions, just own the ambiguity, own the uncertainty. And I cannot, t I mean, I lost count because it's not worth counting, but there were many, many, many times I'd be in a briefing and someone would ask me a question and be like, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I will come back to you. It wasn't about pretending the information was anything other than it was, or you knew more than you did. It was about being very honest and upfront about what you did know and what you didn't know and where there was a bit of a, of a murkier picture. Yeah. You answered no to the imposter syndrome piece. And I'm interested <laughs> to know why that is, um, your views on that. Yeah. So there was uh, no, no imposter syndrome at all, not even at the very, very beginning. No. And, the, it, you know, it's interesting. It's not because I'm like this blindly confident person, but I just, I just, I don't I view things as, as I, I think we've made imposter syndrome into this big thing that this like, oh, well, you know, again, it's, it's very definitive. It's like either I'm an expert or I'm an imposter. Either I've studied and got my PhD in this or I'm just a hack. Right. And again, the reality is never that binary. I've always not had imposter syndrome because I always do the best that I can possibly do and I'm very clear about the things that I don't do. I, you know, and, and again, like I said, even in my, in my work now, it's not about me being the expert in this or the expert in that. It's look, this is what I know. This is, these are the types of problems I can help you fix. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, great. But these are my limitations. I'm not going to try to be someone I'm not. I'm, or aka an imposter. This is who I am. These are my strengths, being very clear and open about them. And then also viewing just in the bigger picture, this again, this conversation around imposter syndrome, as I think a lot of what we can we talk about when we talk about imposter syndrome is this notion of like feeling uncomfortable, feeling out of your depths, feeling outside of your comfort yeah. zone. But that's not being an imposter. That's just someone who's growing. That's just someone who's pushing the limits and the boundaries of their own comfort zone. And I think we've become obsessed with labeling everything and making everything some sort of a syndrome or some sort of a, a, a thing about us when the reality is most people face that uncertainty, that those jitters, that like, oh my gosh, you know, these people are so important in this room and here I am just a lowly such and such, whatever. Everybody feels that at some point. It doesn't mean you're an imposter as long as you're not trying to be someone you're not or trying to pretend you know something you don't. And like I said, it goes back to that thing of just be very upfront and honest in a, in a relevant way about what you do have to offer, what value you are bringing, and equally upfront and honest about all of the things that you're not bringing to the table. And then I think it just becomes a lot easier. That right there is just a beautiful analysis of, <laughs> I think the whole question of imposter syndrome and I guess the the undercurrent and the underlying message is just being confident and comfortable in who you are and just say, look, hey, I'm good at this or I'm not good at that or I don't know this and I don't know that in opposed to having this. And again, so I would I would blame social media for this to a certain mm -hmm. extent, this notion that you have to always be top tier. Mm -hmm. And yeah, top tier is great to aim for, but who operates at that top tier element 
one hundred percent of the time. Yeah. It's it's almost new enough and an impossible expectation to put yeah. on yourself. Of course, yeah, I agree. And also, look, the reality is that first of all, tiering is relatively arbitrary, right? Who is deciding who's the best and who's yeah. the expert and who's not? Because that is filled with all kinds of both biases and, and opinions and subjectivity, right? There's not like there's this mm-hmm. totally objective body out there who's deeming people to be worthy. <laughs> no, there's not. Like it's a lot of it is just reinforced by other people saying, oh, well, that person said that person is an expert. Oh, so they must be an expert, right? So there, and look, of course there's a, there is some objectivity to it. You can't be a total hack and a total just like pretender and, and then people sort of, you know, worship everything you say. You have to have substance behind it. But again, it's being very, very clear about what substance you have and what so-called substance you don't, right? You're not trying to be an expert at everything. You don't have to be the best. You can just be contributing to a conversation. You can just be adding your voice to the discussion or your insights to the problem. It doesn't have to be all like at the absolute top or nothing at all. Mm, yeah. In the book, you you talk about this transition from going from the CIA to being a CEO and actually building a property kind of like empire business type thing. You, you said that, you know, you kind of approached it, never really having been a CEO before. However, you started to notice the similarities between the work that you were doing in the CIA Mm -hmm. and the business world. Can you, and, and the book, it talks a lot about that and Mm -hmm. takeaway points for people to be able to use and implement some of your lessons from the CIA into their own personal Mm -hmm. things. Can you talk very, can you talk very briefly about that? What were the, what was the immediate thing that kind of hit you in the face? Like, hang on a second, this is the business world. It's a different (laughs) thing, but actually that's very similar to this. And you just draw that line and okay, you kind of, you get to that point where you know exactly what to do. Yeah. So a lot of it is, Actually, all of it is is the intangibles, the operating under uncertainty, having to make decisions with incomplete or imperfect information, dealing with you know changing circumstances and scenarios. Uh, how do you you know sort of manage resources and deploy resources in, in you know in in a way that is getting you closer towards achieving your goal or your mission, as you know we would refer to it at the CIA, uh, and also it's around that mindset of resilience and adaptability and agility that now have become buzzwords in the business world. But that is what you have to do, I mean, day in, day out when you're in that kind of environment at the CIA, especially when you're in the field. And so it was all of that that I was like, wow, you know, I'm building this, you know, sort of very, very private sector business, but actually a lot of the tools, a lot of the mental frameworks, a lot of the decision-making frameworks, a lot of the mindset frameworks are hugely valuable to the challenges that I'm facing and that are pretty much universal. And I think, you know, fundamentally performance, high performance, execution, all of that kind of stuff has some core uh, common fundamentals that are as applicable in you know the world of espionage, et cetera, as it is in in any other world, whether it be sports or in you know sort of building a business or anything else, and so that's what I've tried to to focus on in everything that I've shared is look, this is how it worked at the CIA. This is how you can apply it not just in your career but also in your lives because, as I said, the fundamentals are there regardless. And you know I study high performers and high performance. Uh, And I work with a lot of both high performing companies, high performing executives, et cetera, et cetera. And almost without exception, almost, the difference between, you know, the absolute very, very top, top, top and just average is how you manage that intangible head game, the mindset, the setbacks, the challenges, all of that kind of stuff. And most people who get to the top or who become the best at anything, are just really good at persisting, are just really good at finding ways around challenges, finding ways around the many obstacles that life will throw in your way and just persevering. And so that's really what, uh, it shouldn't have surprised me, I guess, you know, but with the benefit of hindsight, it was all of that. It was the mental training and the the mental toughness that is uh, the most priceless thing that I brought with, with me from my time there. Amazing. In the book, you talk a lot about identities and the fact that, you know, in the CIA, you may have uh, operatives who are, you know, they have to have a cover identity, that kind of stuff. And you talk a little bit about that. But then again, you translate that into the real world, understanding your own identity, understanding your own personas. And and you 
the way you explained it was actually pretty fascinating. It actually made me think. You're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, think about your personas when you were high performing or when yeah. you're at your best yeah. and really keying in to what that looks like. Can you explain that a little bit more into depth for the for the listeners? Oh. Because I I definitely get where that comes from. Yeah. But the way you've the way you positioned and framed this for me, well, I, I sat there and I was like, hmm, okay. I can see how it works, but for the benefit of people, can you please yeah. just like, elaborate on that? Sure, sure. So the idea of personas is that we all have many, many, many facets to who we are. You know, so I will take myself as an example. I'm a parent to two young children. I'm a woman. I'm a person of color. I'm a New Yorker. I'm an American. I'm a, you know, sort of an analyst. I'm a strategist. I'm a coach. I'm many things. And no one of those personas or those many hats that I wear is necessarily um, totally in isolation, right? But what we often do is try to compartmentalize ourselves and compartmentalize our, our lives and say, okay, well, you know, in, you know, at home, I can be this. In my social circles, I can be this. But at work, I have to be this. And there is, again, scope for uh, not bringing your whole self to work or to any environment all the time. But we all have different ways that we excel. And so again, this, this notion of and, and different contexts in which we excel in different ways. And so this notion of personas is to tap into the persona that's most relevant for the situation that you're about to confront. So it's almost like putting on you know, like Superman has that phone booth moment where he goes into a phone booth and yeah. he turns yeah. from being this sort of like very shy, yeah. retiring journalist into being a superhero. Yeah. Or for those of you who grew up in the 80s, uh, like me, ever remember that cartoon gem, there was this, you know, this yeah. performer, she yeah. would be just like a normal, nice, you know, everyday teenage girl. And then she'd put on her earrings and touch her ear and then it'd be showtime and she'd transform into this like international rock star, right? So then the idea being that- That we is a proper 80s moment. I love that. <laughs> gem is gem. And so <laughs> the idea is that you can dial up or dial down elements of your personality as relevant. You don't have to be all things all the time to all people, but to be very intentional and careful about what you are bringing. So for example, you know, when I want to get into my sort of like badass performer, you know, I'm about to go into in front of a stage full of, you know, thousands of people, my preparation, my internal process, my the visualizations, the breathing exercises, the, the clothes that I wear, the things that get me mentally ready to put on my gem persona will be totally different than when I'm getting ready to go, you know, switch from work mode into to child mode when I go to pick up my girls from, from school. So the mm. idea is, again, is to think about, you know, the aspects of who you are that you want to bring into a certain environment and find the tools and again, whether it's meditation, visualization, power poses, experiment with all of it so that you can put it on and take it off. And again, it's not about being somebody you're not. It's just about dialing up or dialing down different elements of your personality, depending on what the context requires. And sometimes for many of us going into high pressure environments is being reminded of, of uh, giving us that, that confidence boost to go out there and go into that really... Um, a stressful meeting or have that difficult conversation. And that's when the sort of the success persona can be really helpful. So it's, again, internalizing successes you might have had in sports or in your hobbies or in something else and tapping into that feeling, that adrenaline high you got when you, I don't know, finished the London Marathon or when you, you know, had your first performance at, I don't know, of when you were learning how to play the cello, whatever it is, right? But mm -hmm. we all have those moments of excellence, those moments that we can point to in our lives where it was like, that was when I was on top of the world. I felt really like, you know, the world was my oyster and it was this really great energy buzz and high. You can, again, sort of almost trick yourself into reliving that moment, whether through visualizations or meditations or listening to really pumping music, whatever it is to trigger your brain to, to get more into success mode. So you've got that confidence, you've got that sort of more powerful mindset as you go into a meeting or a conversation or even a phone call, because all of these things, I know it sounds a bit strange, but these, if, if you're not used to doing it, but 
all of these things make a huge difference. Your energy, where your head is at, how you feel, all of that stuff will leak out into the world in some capacity. So anything you can do to help even just get a few, a little bit further along than you might otherwise be is worth at least experimenting with, is my, is my view yeah. on things. So, you know, if it works for yeah. p- athletes and hot, you know, and CEOs and high performers and Olympians, then, you know, it's probably worth giving it a go. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'm 100% with you on that. I mean, people talk about the psychology, the psychology, and the power of the mind, and the fact that it it does amazing things. And I don't quite, unless you've tapped into it before to really understand, oh, my God, like, it really works. It it sounds a bit strange when you hear it off the cuff like that. But the brain is is a is an amazing thing in terms of just helping you be ready, your preparedness and just the attitude going into something that you know is going to be challenging. It makes a whole world of difference. It really, really does. Yeah. And you know, because we are human beings at the end of the day, and you know, the power, the strength that we have to muster for some things, it's not all physical. (laughs) It's just not. It really, really isn't. A hundred percent. And the thing is, is that so often what happens is, you know, we're preparing for these high pressured or stressful environments. And all we do is we rehearse over and over in our heads. It's going to be a disaster or I'm going to choke or it's going to be this. And, and what, and I refer to it as we rehearse the, the negatives, but we never rehearse the positives, right? We never get, or not never, but many of us don't ever spend enough time thinking about, wow, you know, this is what it's going to feel like when I go on that stage and I stand with confidence and I deliver my message or when I stand in front of my team and and do that presentation, you know, and I, I go through all of the points and I, you know, I answer the questions as best as I can. We, we are so good at visualizing the, the negative, but not visualizing the success. And so sometimes it can just be, to sort of short circuit that instinct for the negative to say, okay, well, you know, I've got this really stressful presentation coming up at the end of this week. I'm not going to obsess over the stress. I'm going to obsess over rechannel that energy and and focus on my preparation, on you know, practicing and rehearsing if that's useful. And then in my head, instead of visualizing all of the disasters, to visualize the positives, to visualize people looking at me and nodding and saying, oh, wow, that's a great idea or whatever it is, right? Again, it just puts you in a slightly different mindset as you go into that presentation so that even if the reality, the reality is always different than we imagine, by the way, both when we imagine disasters and when we imagine nothing but like glowing, you know, accolades, but at least give yourself the leg up to go in feeling a bit more positive by having rehearsed the positive instead of having rehearsed all of the negative. Yeah, the, the phrase control the controllables comes to yeah. mind. Yeah, like exactly. whenever you go into any circumstance or any situation, there are things that you can influence, there are things that exactly. you can't. Exactly. And a lot of things that you can influence are under your control. So yep. for me, it's all about making sure, right, for this meeting, I'm I'm prepared. Yes. If I'm doing anything, I'm prepared yeah. as much as I possibly can yep. be so that those controllables I can tick off. And if yep. anything else comes along that derails things, it's not because yep. I was ill prepared. Yeah. And I think that's really important uh, to exactly. kind of make sure that you you, you tap into. In yeah. the book, you also talk about, you know, personal energy maps. Yeah. And, and the way you position this as well is actually quite interesting. Can you just explain what you mean by personal energy maps? Sure. Um, just for, for the listeners and the viewers. My pleasure. So the idea is that all of us have different natural flows to our energy, whether We feel high energy, low energy, a bit more social, a bit more inwards, a bit more analytical, a bit more process oriented. You know, we have these and I don't know where they come from. I'm not sort of giving you, uh, you know, a scientific background, but the reality is we all have different energy peaks and troughs and different sort of uh, times in the day or the week or the year where we just find ourselves naturally shifting towards a different energy. And Instead of being conscious of it and mapping it out, what we often do is constantly butt up against a brick wall. And it's that thing Mm -hmm. of like, you know, you want to be out and physical and doing something, I don't know, maybe business development related and meeting with clients, but actually you force yourself to go and, you know, do that proposal or that administrative task or whatever it is. And the reality is, look, not everybody can always operate in perfect alignment with their energies. But once you make it conscious, once you map it out, then you know where your natural tendencies are. And then when you do have 
the flexibility to align what you're doing with where your energy naturally shifts, it just makes it that much more a smooth process and a less frictionful process because there is so much friction in our day-to-day lives. There's so much like micro frustrations and things that you feel like you can't control or that are just you having to do, even though you don't sort of like feel like you're ready to do it yet or whatever the case may be. And so being very conscious of your personal energy map allows you to live in alignment with it and orchestrate and design your day and your tasks so it can be more in alignment with it than not. And then of course, not everybody has 100% control over their schedule. So when you are unable to be in alignment with it, it's to, to make whatever shifts that you can. So for example, uh, you know, you alluded to it earlier. One of the things that I know about myself is that my Monday energy is relatively low. So whenever possible, I try not to do anything that will require a lot of high energy uh, things like presentations or talks or, or, or podcast interviews on a Monday. But sometimes, like today, an opportunity comes up and you don't want to say no to it just because it's a Monday. So I do whatever I need to do to G myself up and get you know sort of my head in the in the game for this Monday interview. And I make that exception intentionally and then can go back and you know sort of go back into my Monday energy. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing in either my way or the highway. It's make the, the corrections and the changes where you can. And then find ways to sort of hack into your processing when you need to, so that it can make it that much more, like I said, less frictionful um, and a bit more of a smooth process. Yeah, I, I would say that I, I struggle with it slightly because hmm. for me, to the, to the absolute hatred and just dislike of, for my partner, yeah. I'm super productive overnight. Yeah. So and it's weird since since before I could even remember when I was in corporate land, if I've had to work overnight, so like I would say probably two a.m. to like four a.m. for me, I'm super super productive. Wow. But that means I don't get any sleep. Yeah. And oftentimes <laughs> when when I was in corporate land, what would happen is I would I would have found myself in a situation where I've got to work through this overnight. Mm-hmm. I'm knackered because I haven't had any sleep. But because I'm running on adrenaline through the day, the day is super productive. Mm. And I've always struggled with, okay, how do I bring in, right, my optimal hours? Because two to four isn't great. It's not great, (laughs) really. really. And I don't sleep enough as it is. But it is being aware of, okay, those are your really productive hours. So stick to stuff that requires a lot of brain power and for you to be productive in those those hours in opposed to, some other hours where you're low energy, you're not that productive anyway, because you're not really getting the best out of things. Exactly. And also it's, look, this isn't like, so the thing about the personal energy map is that it's not a fixed thing. It's not, you set it and then that's how it is forevermore. You will change your shift, you know, over time and over, you know, again, depending on what's happening in your life or, you know, other demands on your time and your energy, it might be that, you know, actually, you know what, next month is totally different. So it's just to be attuned to those shifts internally so that when it is realistic to change, you can. But for something like that, you know, maybe again, it's worth experimenting with. You say maybe Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, I'll, I'll do two to 4 a.m. and then sleep normal hours, you know, for the rest of the week just to, to try to make up for it. Or on those days that I am awake two to four, I'll go to bed earlier so that at least I'm getting six hours before I'm waking up at two. And, you know, I have a a better, uh, just sort of a better um, alertness or, you know, feel more Mm -hmm. awake during normal uh, waking hours. You, again, to the extent that you have the control and the independence, you can play around with it and see what works. And I am a huge advocate for sleep. I I, I would say, you know, it, you know, and it's the science backs me up. It's not just me saying it, but like we. My miss keeps telling me you're not sleeping enough. You're not sleeping <laughs> enough. I, yeah, I get it. I do. No, but so all I'm saying is play around with when you go to bed if you're waking up at two, and then maybe schedule in a couple of naps during the day if that works for you. Or you know, like I suggest, maybe do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the rest of the week you're sleeping normally. And this is, you know, this is just one example, but. Again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Either I'm working two to four every day and like exhausted all the time, or I'm just conforming to other people's schedules. You can play around with it and see what works until you find something that works. Yeah. So I'm interested to know, um, obviously you transitioned from CIA into the business world. 
and operating within the business world, being up to your best, your optimal is important to obviously success and success comes in different forms. Sure. Some people look at financial success as being one of the main metrics that they look at, or, mm-hmm. although I feel as though certainly as I've gotten older, financial success is not really the pinnacle of things. Yeah. Um, and I think background has a lot to do in terms of how you rank what yeah. success means to yeah. you, but it is so much more far reaching. Mm. I'm interested to know how the lessons that you've learned, you know, mm. moving from the CIA into the business world, yeah. has have, have any of those lessons helped you make better decisions from, you know, a financial, personal finance point of view? And how do you view yeah. that intersect with everything you've learned to how you apply, you know, personal things and when it comes to finances and so on and so forth? Oh, so there are two, uh, two, I guess, main parts of my answer to that. One is I have sort of like you uh, as well, defined success and wealth in a broader way beyond just financial. Because for me, mm-hmm. it's also about having a wealth of experiences, a wealth of stories, uh, a wealth of uh, connections, and a wealth of impact. And hopefully all of those things can come with financial wealth as well. But it doesn't have to be uh, that the financial is the only thing that counts. You know, when I look, the way I always think about it is what legacy do I want to have? And for me, fundamentally, I want the two things I want is to make sure that when I was alive, I tried as hard as I possibly could to tap into my potential and to push myself in, in, you know, in many different ways to see what I might be made of. And the second thing is to have as much of a positive impact on as many people in the world as I possibly can. Those are my two things, my potential and my impact. So it's not just about, oh, well, if I don't become, you know, a multimillionaire by the age of 45, then I'm a failure. It's okay. Well, on this element of, on these metrics, this is where I am, but on these metrics, this is where I am. And the total picture of it, am I satisfied? It doesn't mean I'm complacent and I'm just sitting, you know, now on my, on my backside and doing nothing and waiting to die. It's, and just taking a constant, sort of like a, an evolving picture of, you know, where am I at? Am I satisfied? Am I feeling like I'm doing the, the, the core of, you know, having an impact, tapping into my potential, et cetera. And so it's about the financial wealth for sure, because you can have a hugely positive impact on millions, billions of people if you control lots and lots of wealth. So it's not to discount the financial wealth, but it's to also for me to count the other things that you can't always quantify, right? the quality of your relationships. Do you feel that you, for me is, do I have enough love in my life? Do I have enough intellectual stimulation in my life? And it, again, it doesn't have to be either you have wealth, financial wealth, or you have these things. It can be you know, all woven in together. But when I'm looking and trying to evaluate sort of where I'm at, I look at everything and not just the money. Having said that, the money counts. And so I do do a regular inventory of, am I less in debt now you know do i have less a a smaller mortgage balance than i did last year or what is my plan Mm -hmm. to shrink the the you know the amount of debt that i'm carrying or you know from year to year to year more fundamentally is my net wealth and again here i'm just talking about pure financial wealth is my net wealth increasing every year Mm -hmm. and it could be you know a couple of thousand pounds it could be by hundreds of thousands of pounds that's fine as long as i'm going in the right direction and so I quantify what can be quantified and make sure I'm making progress on, as I said, increasing my net wealth every year. But I'm also making sure that I am taking a bigger picture view of all of the types of wealth in my life. And while the financial wealth is very, very important and can enable many other things, I want to make sure that I'm not letting go of some of the other stuff that adds richness to my life. I'm so glad that you answered that in that way, because, um, yeah, I I think... Social media will have people believe that it is all about the money and it's it's just not. And maybe it takes a little bit of experience to come to that conclusion and to realize that you have a moment or moments of, you know, epiphanies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for a lot of people who are on social media right now, especially if they're, you know, in their 20s or so, they're being told it's all about the bag and it's not mm-hmm. necessarily for you how what would you how if you had to rank you know you talked about different different areas of wealth that you measure how would you rank them where does finance money actually mm. come in the ranking to what matters to you uh, it's probably top 3 if i had to i mean i've never been asked that question so i'm just thinking on the fly here um and it's because of what i said is having wealth gives you a huge amount of 
of power to help other people and have that impact. And for me, it would be for things like, you know, building libraries, increasing financial literacy in schools and doing things that require money and investment beyond just me as an individual, because I can only leverage my time and my energy and my money, you know, so much where mm -hmm. in order to have, you know, massive ripple effects and lots of impact at scale, there is a there is a role for the money to to play. So it's definitely in the top, but it's not and there will be times in my life where maybe it's number one versus number three or whatever. Um, but it's, it's definitely in the top. I'm not being, you know, I, that's my, th that's my view on things. And I think, you know, the, the size of the ambitions and the size of the impact that I want to have will require some financial power behind it. But I also recognize that I can get to the end goal of having the impact, having the other things in different ways. And so finance will be one side of it, but there will be other elements that, you know, that I can bring to bear. And for me, I guess some of it is really just making sure that I'm not letting any, any uh, element of that sort of overtake any of the other stuff that I know is equally important. So money's important, but it's not the most important. Mm, yeah and you kind of use the word evolving a little mm. bit earlier on and i think it it is important to understand that everything is an evolving is an evolving thing on your list evolving priorities that's all, if you want to buy a house right now then yeah money is really important <laughs> exactly. it's really really important exactly. but actually if you're two way two years away from actually you know uh buying a house what's probably most important is how you're earning the money so the career the mm -hmm. business the workplace so being Yep. top of the game or yep. as best as you possibly can be in that environment to get you promotions and so on and so forth so it is yep. always an evolving piece yep. i think and i think people need to remember that and make sure that they prioritize things uh, accordingly and also to recognize that everything is a trade-off right so as long as you're being very clear-eyed and very conscious and intentional about the trade-offs that you are making then fair play right so i so for example Again, another one of sort of my my guiding life's philosophies is to never say no to an adventure. And so, for example, when the CIA asks you if you want to apply for a job there, that's an adventure that I could not have planned for. I could have, at that point in my career, decided that, you know what, screw it, I want to go work for a big bank and, and make bank because, again, money is important. But I chose adventure in that instance. Or when I was at studying for my MBA after my first year of the MBA program, it was London 2012 and they were looking for volunteers and I volunteered and I was, uh, and I auditioned and all, did all that great stuff. And they wanted me to be uh, in both the opening and closing ceremonies. And I thought, well, I could get an internship at, you know, a big name consulting firm or a big name yeah. bank and make money and make the most out of my MBA summer. Or I could say yes to this adventure. When am I ever going to be in a city that's hosting the Olympics where they're looking for volunteers? And by the way, where I can actually yeah. be one of those volunteers. So yeah. It's acknowledging the trade-offs. I very happily and willingly made those trade-offs because those are my values. That's what's important to me. But if you have other things that are important to you, that's okay too. You just have to choose and make sure you know what you are saying yes to requires you to say no to other things and vice versa. So just make sure that it is in alignment with what you care about. And it will, and using that phrase again, it will change and evolve over time. That's okay. But just be very, very clear and honest with yourself about what all of your decisions are requiring of you. All right. I've got two closing questions for Let's you, which are quick, quick, quick round fire yeah. type things, right? So the first one is, what's the number one lesson you've learned from being in the CIA? Ooh, it's important who you surround yourself with. So I know that's an obvious one, um, but a, a pithier way of saying it is, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I can tell you definitively that, look, I'm, let's be honest, I was smart, I was driven already going in. I got really lucky with the team that I got to work with because they were some of the smartest, some of the most brilliant, some of the most incredible people that I've ever encountered, not just at the CIA, but even in, in the, sort of the outside world. And I could feel being in that context was forcing me to up my game even more. So, you know, I started at a baseline of this is my standard and this is how good I am at this point in my life. Being in that environment made me that much better. And so I was very conscious of it too, because I was like, wow, the way they think about things, the way they do things, you know, I, I was sort of absorbing from, from the people I was working with and it makes all the difference in the world. So whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you care about, make sure the people you are surrounding yourself with 
are helping you get to that thing that you care about that are helping push you forward and upward and onwards as opposed to keeping you stagnant and the same. Brilliant answer. I like that. I like that a lot. The second one, what's the number one lesson you've learned from the world of business? Oh, uh, it's not just business, but it's just, but it becomes more and more uh, in your face in business, I guess, is you don't always get what you deserve. And this, again, this yeah. is true in life as well. So you can have the best product, the best service, the best idea, the best marketing and whatever it is. And then bam, there'll be a global pandemic that shuts your doors overnight, or there'll be a war, or there will be a market crash, or there will be an interest rate hike, uh, rate hike, or all of these many things outside of your control. And sometimes you just, the timing is wrong. And that's all it is. It's, you know, again, you did the best you could do. You tried your hardest, you put your best foot forward, all of that great stuff. Sometimes no matter how much you quote unquote deserve it, you won't get the thing. But equally, sometimes you can sort of half ass it and get really lucky. You can sort yeah. of put your, you know, sort of a, 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 a very faulty, I don't know, beta product into the world and everybody loves it and you're off and running, right? So it works both ways. Life isn't fair, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There's no <laughs> sort of real, it's meritocratic to a certain extent, but sometimes things will happen outside of your control that help you. And other times it'll happen outside of your control that hurt you. And all you have to do is, as we said earlier, control the controllables, make sure you keep going, you persist, you find a way around, through, under, whatever it takes, because, you know, you just got to be in it long enough for the luck to finally kick in. So make sure you don't give up. That's brilliant. Right. So how do people find you if they want to work with you or just follow what you're doing? What's the best way for people to link with you? Uh, best way is to find me via my website, which is rupalypatel.com. Or you can follow me on Instagram, which is also rupalypatel.com. Oh, rupalypatel. <laughs> Perfect. Right. What I will do, you guys, is I will leave all of the links in the show notes and in the description on YouTube if you're watching over here on YouTube. I just want to say thank you for coming on and spending this time with me as oh, a Monday okay. as well. As yes. a Monday as well. Yes. Well, it set me <laughs> up for a beautiful rest of the week because now I'm sort of buzzing and full of energy. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rupu. All right. So guys, look, this was a very, very different conversation to the one that we normally have, like I've already said. But, you know, some of the things that I wanted to cover this year is how you optimize yourself as a person so that you, from a financial point of view, have the freedom and the choices. You have the ability to make good decisions. And as much as we love to talk about money here, and it is an important factor, it isn't the most important factor. And if I've learned anything through my career, it is, you know, personal development is key and being able to understand yourself. And I'm still learning about myself and understanding, you know, how to navigate certain things. It is an ever ending, it's never ending and it's always an evolving situation. And so picking up books like this for me are just full of gems. And if you haven't already, you should definitely go pick this up. It's definitely worth a read. Like I said, I haven't got through all of it just yet. And there's so much I wanted to ask. And there's so much more really to ask. And once I've completed this, I'm going to find out if RuPaul would be happy to uh, perhaps come back and uh, discuss the rest of the things in the book. But I'll also leave a link to this down in the show notes and also on the YouTube description. But guys, whatever it is that you're doing, remember this week, money's a tool, life is for living. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. And I'll catch you next Monday.